First there were the machines. They put them in studios and created an industry. Now the young filmmakers are reclaiming the camera for the individual. To them, it is an artist's tool. Through it, they see us in a new way. With it, they are creating a revolution in the way we see. Artists and audience, we are all a film generation. I mean, we're not concerned with yesterday and tomorrow at all. You know, we're only concerned with this moment and the feeling that you know, takes place at this particular time. That a person can make a film as bizarre as he can possibly imagine, that it's not too crazy. That's probably one of the great weaknesses of so-called documentary films, is they tend to be about what's okay and not about what's really going on. A film, when it's finished, is an experience for the audience. When it's being made, it's an experience, it's an experience for the filmmaker. I think that the artist today is a very important man in society because he's the man who has the responsibility. He has to be the responsible, self-conscious seeker of, of, of reality for other people. My favorite is the experimental film. I think all films experimental it should be experimental. It, it, one might say it's like uh, opening up a, a, a whole bunch of doors uh, to something which people felt had only one door to before. But films are great. <laughs> Film is great. Somehow a natural. They speak its language. It speaks their language. A film called 12 12 42, for example, by Bernard Stone, Tom McDonough, and Carmen DeVino. A young movie about a young girl. Cruelly satirical, technically sophisticated, it is a good introduction to the way kids feel and see. Roll camera. La -da -da. B. Mimi Sarner, scene one, take three, sound three. I was born in 1942, 12, 12, 42, in the good old Bronx. I was born during World War II. I don't know anything about World War II. I can remember my childhood back to when I was about two. We're fighting the Germans. And we were fighting the Japanese. And we were fighting the Italians. But I had German friends and Italian friends and Japanese friends. I don't want to talk about it. Sometimes I, I can remember it. I took my little drum and I walked down this march down the street in the Bronx, screaming and yelling at the top of my lungs and banging my little drum, my daddy is coming home, my daddy is coming home. And every time my mother tells me this, you know, my, my ears, my eyes start, you know, filling with tears. I remember distinctly, I'm in my crib and I was wearing yellow pajamas, you know, they cover your feet and with all the snaps and everything. And it was late at night, I know that. And all of a sudden, the light went on. I never saw my father, just a picture. All of a sudden, this handsome-looking man comes at the door, and he stands there looking at me with a big smile on his face, and I yelled out, Daddy, Daddy! And I knew him, I knew him, and I'll never forget this. I'll never forget this as long as I live. My father loves to come home after work and sit down and read the paper, have dinner, watch TV, and go to sleep. I was always closer to my mother. Would you be to marry a rich, rich man? Everybody had a TV set. Uh, my mind is completely different than my mother's. I read the headlines and that's it. Um, my mother would knock on the door and she'd say, what are you doing in there so hard? I listen to the news three or four times a day. Well, now it's time, you know, that you've had babies and you have to give it all up. But she'd see me there standing with a bow on my head. You can't have your cake and eat it too. And I disagree completely. And she'd say to me, well, what on earth are you doing? I've been meeting the right people at the right time. I feel that behind every successful businessman there's a woman. You know, dog eat dog. And I used to feel so embarrassed. I feel what's good for the goose is good for the gander. What are you doing with those clothes on? Mama keeps calling and... I say, well, Mother, I, I'm practicing. I'm, um... Mama, every Friday night, a piece of merchandise. Salami today. To be bought and sold, that's all. But I accept reality. But I don't like to dote upon it. And that's what I would do in my room. Because if you don't go to Mama every Friday night, I haven't picked up a paper in a year. 
I still like Shakespeare. Oh, Mom, I want to be an actress. Mom, I'd, I'd like to study. Wait till you get older. Make up your mind. You know, be sure of what you want to do. I know what's going on in the world. And I, I realize it. And it hurts me. Because I love the country. It really hurts me. I love the flowers and the trees. But I wanted to take up dramatics. And a house in the country. I know people are getting stabbed, knife shot, and everything all over the place. I just don't care to read about it. Because if I constantly read about it, then I'm prone to think about it. I could believe in, very, in a lot of things very strongly. But, you know, you can be a nonconformist, but there are certain ways you must conform to society. Free at last! Free at last! Thank God Almighty! We are free at last! I'll tell you, I went to George Washington High School. And George Washington High School was like a little United Nations. The school was one third Negro, the other third was mixed. <laughs> the earth is so huge, a great big ball. I like to experience every phase of life. And here am I, so very small. <laughs> there was one teacher that left a lasting impression on me because he used to keep me after class every day. <laughs> I searched and searched to find my home. If I so much as turned around to look at the boy behind me. But I'm so lost. Where shall I run? And he kept me after class constantly. And you know what we would do after class? So many souls that are so near might lend a hand. We would chit-chat about my plans for the weekend, about the fellows I've been dating. But none do care. And I think he liked me. So onward bound to seek the light. Everybody has a superego, right? I pray the hand to guide my flight. There are so many things to do, so many things to see, and I'd like to do some of them and see some of them. I like to go to the theater, and I like to read, and I like to write poetry, and I like to listen to poetry, and I like to go to the concert, and I like the opera. I like the ballet. Just as much as I love a good ball game. Success to me is when you have something to give to somebody, to be able to give to somebody, no matter what it is, to give from yourself to someone else to get on the stage and say something funny and make somebody laugh. Life is just a bowl of cherry. But to say something very, very sad and to make somebody in the audience feel. Not long ago, I received a letter. She spoke of the pain and the loss and the tears that are ever ready to flow. Like the old soldier of that ballad. Don't take it serious. Life's too mysterious, I talk my thoughts. But through all of this were words of encouragement for me from this dear little lady. You laugh and you worry so. You tried to do his duty. As God gave him the light. So we ask God to bless you and your little family. And just fade away. I'd like to, to learn at least how to carry a tune. <laughs> Following this principle, I think... The communists can just walk right in. To develop a consensus among the power groups in the nation. The communists get involved, and there you go. Boom. Now, following that... I think we can hold them. To me, the worst thing anybody in this world can do is to take it upon themselves to take their life or anybody else's. There's only one man who can do that. The man upstairs. And we will begin. Well, let's see, I lived under Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson, and, uh...
Of course, our president I greatly admire. He is our president, and I give him due respect. Because he is our president. Given the opportunity, I feel everyone could murder. This effort is what we will pursue in the great society. I'm not talking about self-defense. I'm talking about deliberate, cold-blooded, unadulterated murder. For my countrymen, in those words, are to be found the greatness of this nation. And also, the strength of its president. There is a little flower upon a lonely hill. A pink and yellow flower sitting there so still. No blades of grass, no other buds. The trees are even bare. My eyes lay fixed upon it. What is it doing there? The earth is cold, the sky is dark, the clouds are all too gray. No warmth, no light for a flower. No, not one little ray. I hear a crash of thunder. There's a fire across the sky. It pours, it pours too heavily. Oh, please don't bend and die. I stand there fixed. I cannot move my head back to the ground. The wind is silent now. At last, there is no sound. It is so serene and tempered now. I can gaze upon the hill. I see a pink and yellow flower. It's sitting there so still. 121242 seeks one kind of reality. These people have another vision. They make documentaries in the style known as cinema verite. Their search is for the odd moment of truth hidden beneath the surface of things, people, and events. Don Pennybaker is a pioneer in this movement. He has explored some of the most famous images of our time. He is best known for Don't Look Back, a feature-length slice of singer Bob Dylan's life. Hey, the Beatles are here. Like failure 
And that failure's no success at all At midnight trembles The country doctor rambles Bankers' nieces seek perfection Expecting all the gifts that wise men bring The wind howls like a hammer The night blows cold and rain My love, she's like some raven And my window with a blow <laughs> go, driver, go. Go, driver. Oh, that was a good concert. That's a good concert. Beautiful. They were all there, man. Some people uh, under cameras, obviously, are going to uh, behave differently than others. And I think over a period of time, uh, what you're after isn't so much... I don't think you're really, for instance, trying to catch the person through a, uh, a, a keyhole. You're not trying to catch them with their pants down or saying something naughty on the phone. What you're really after is... Uh, uh, a sense of what they think they're up to acted out in real life instead of acted out against a, uh, some sort of a stage. You, you've got to have a uh, kind of an evidence gathering period uh, which is mandatory and, and before that it's pretty hard to know just what, what uh, shape the thing is going to take. In fact it's meaningless to try to decide. So when uh, Dylan came in came in, or Dylan, his, his manager came in and wanted to know if we were interested in doing a film on it. I really was. And uh, so from there on, it was just kind of, uh, uh, nobody had any clear idea of what kind of a film. I guess I had a sense of, of how I wanted to do it, the approach. Uh, I think Dylan may have had a different idea in his head, but he didn't, uh, he never really said anything. I mean, it doesn't do me any good to start off with a lot of preconceptions, or why do it? I mean, the thing that makes me do it is to find out about it. Sort of. I mean, I'm just finding out about it, but I'm using a camera where a writer would run around, you know, on his legs and find out about it. Uh, and so I'm, using, I'm finding out about it with a, a, a means that actually, actually also sort of freezes it. So my editing, which is roughly uh, uh, analogous to what a writer does when he sits down at a typewriter, uh, is putting it into form. Uh, it's a little different, but it's probably sort of the same thing. Well, I guess I'm interested in, in things going a little deeper than uh, sort of superficial opinions about things. Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I've always moved uh, myself when people who have, who have uh, drawn up some kind of commitment to their actions have said, well, this is, what I, this is what I believe in, this is what I don't give a damn about, and this is what I would fight for. When you get them in some situation where, where they have to translate that into action and they do it, and they do it in the way that they uh, indicated they would, uh, that's kind of a fantastic vindication of some sort, and that's something that, that film can uh, record uniquely. Are you going to see the concert tonight? Are you going to hear it? Okay, you hear and see it, and uh, it's going to happen fast, and you're not going to get it all, and you might even hear the wrong words, you know? And then afterwards, see, I, okay, I won't be able to talk to you afterwards. I got nothing to say about these things I write. I mean, I just write them. I don't to say anything about them. I don't write them for any reason. There's no great message. I mean, if, if you know, you want to tell other people that, go ahead and tell them. But I'm not going to have to answer to it. And they're just going to think, you know, what's this Time Magazine telling us? But that, you couldn't care less about that either. You don't know the people that read you. Oh. Uh, because, you know, uh, I've never been in Time Magazine, and yet this hall is filled twice. You know, uh, and I've never been in Time Magazine. I don't need Time Magazine. And I don't think I'm a folk singer. You'll probably call me a folk singer, but
but you know the other people know better because the people that you know that, that buy my records listen to me know necessarily read Time Magazine. You know the audience that subscribe to Time Magazine, the audience of, of the, the people that want to know what's happening in the world week by week, the people that work during the day and can read it. It's small, right, and it's concise, and there's pictures in it. I mean, those kind of you know those a certain class of people. It's a class of people that take the magazine seriously. I mean, sure, I can read it. You know, I read it. I read it on the airplanes, but I don't take it seriously. If I want to find out anything, I'm not going to read Time magazine. I'm not going to read Newsweek. I'm not going to read any of these magazines. I mean, because they just got too much to lose by printing the truth. You know that. What kinds of truths are they reading? On anything, even on a worldwide basis. They just go off the stands in a day if they printed really the truth. What is really the truth? The really, the truth is just a plain picture. Okay. Of, of, you know, a plain picture of... Uh, of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 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 you know, a tramp vomiting, man, into the sewer, you know, and, 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 uh, and next door to the picture, uh, you know, Mr. Rockefeller or, you know, Mr. Uh, C.W. C. Jones, you know, on the subway going to work. Uh, you know, any kind of picture. Just, just make some sort of collage of pictures, which they don't do. They don't do. There's no ideas in Time Magazine. There's just these facts. There's no other way of recording that. You know what I mean? The person says, well, uh, I don't, most things I don't care about, but if somebody uh, uh, accuses me of this, uh, I, this is what my reply, this is the way I'll reply, you know, or if, if somebody starts shooting at me, I'll really be brave, you know, I'll start shooting, whatever it is. And then the thing happens, and they do that. Uh, you've kind of performed a marvelous sort of thing there that's no way else t to do it, you know? I think the minimal team is two people, and, uh, and it's kind of multiples of that. Uh, two people have a camera and a recorder. The cameraman has this, and the uh, person taking sound has that. I mean, I, I think that in another two or three years, this uh, steam engine will be replaced by Super 8 cameras, which will be no bigger than amateur cameras people use now. And they'll have sound available to them in some fairly light way. And people will be able to record what goes on as easily as they now can shoot uh, Polaroid uh, cameras. I have always had the uh, conviction that in order to make this kind of a film anyway, they had to be looking through the camera. Uh, and I suppose uh, that means that innately anyway, I'm probably a cameraman. Well, I'm a filmmaker. Beyond that, I don't think I'm committed to having to make any type of film. I mean, I can, I'd like to feel like I'd go out and make a silent film tomorrow or a film with a tripod or anything else, a film on bugs. I'm interested in the adventure of making the film because a lot of people I know when they, somebody says, let's make a movie, the reason they want to do it, the reason they're excited about it is because that's a kind of adventure for them. Afterwards, they wonder, my God, that dumb thing that I did that summer. But the doing of it was terrific. Well, I'm really interested in the adventure that happened. And this is the only way to get that, you see. So that's the difference. But it's possible to have a film be an adventure, too. You just have to go at it a different way. anticipates the technologies of the next 30, 40, 50 years. The artist is always a generation ahead of the technologies. Now, his perceptions are just that much faster. The voice from the machine is Marshall McLuhan's. His message needs no elaboration, except to note that the filmmaker obviously mans one of the key outposts on what he likes to call the distant early warning line of the future. You are about to join a group of them on that due line, which is to say that you are about to see some strange blips on your screen. They are not necessarily evidence of a hostile attack. The next film, Para 1000, is a test flight for the new cinema. Believe it or not, it is an advertising film designed to promote the wares of a chic New York dress shop.
the other young men with whom he made Para 1000, still photographer Richard Davis had never made a moving picture before. His thing is visual, not verbal. To him, to all of them, the look of a film is more important than its content. The medium is the message. Well, dramatically, I don't know uh, how successful the film is. You know, I mean, we, t we tried at some points to... Uh, to give it uh, a thread of meaning, you know. uh, and that never worked out. I don't think that uh, uh, it's a, any kind of a dramatic statement at all, you know, or it means anything other than what it is. You know. Jim Signorelli started out to be a stage designer, but quickly shifted to film. Why people make films? You make films because at one point you understand that uh, you've been sitting in a movie house ever since you were nine and watching certain phenomena occur on the screen and suddenly you get the feeling that you can do that. You know how that works. Bruce Bacon was an advertising art director before picking up a camera. Film for so long was adjusted, was, it was edited in order to make it appear as if the first thing happened and then the next thing happened and so forth. And now when you do things and you do it backwards and shuffle it together, you get all that conglomeration together, you know, you get all that junk and you put it all and you shake it up in the bag and then there, since there's no beginning and no end, you begin to f experiment with this business of surreality by dissociating the audience. It seems that, you know, the act of making pictures, uh, you know, this kind of picture and, and, and that kind of picture is the same because they, they both relate to time. Well, there's a different way of squashing the time together. What you do is you take a lot of non-specific 
a graphic material and jumble it all together and present it to people as a film. And people have a certain expectation of what's going to happen when they sit down in front of a screen. When you do not fulfill that expectation, or when you fulfill it in some way, uh, some indirect way, then you begin to change their idea of what is real. It's because the Hollywood film always had a uh, time continuum, you know, and, and real life, what do you call it, real time or something. Can you remember the first time you ever went to a movie and suddenly realized that it wasn't reality on the screen? Does, it, does the documentary film, uh, is it ready to be accepted as, as an art form, uh, or the, 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 the so-called realism in film? And I don't think so. I think people still think it's real, you see. And it'll be years from now that people will be able to look at it and say, oh, I see what the hell they were doing. They were, you know, they were making a, a, an adaptation of unreality reality. That all went out the window when I learned that the nature of film was not this business of recording the event so much and not the business of, of uh, translating the thing into dramatic, trans translating the, the, the activity into dramatic terms that could be understood by the audience. But the, the nature of film and the essence of film is time. And it's in experimenting with time and, and explaining to people uh, how I perceive time and how I perceive activity on the Earth's sur surface, as it were, is, has become much more important than this kind of ritualistic uh, doing the scene correctly, getting the, the camera angles correct, getting the direction right, making it believable. Because we're going to find in 10 years that the most believable films now, the, the cinema verite, are no longer believable because we're all acting all the time. I'm acting now when I talk to you, you're acting when you talk to me. Even if Gene's not here with the camera, we're acting. The fourth member of the Parrot team is Don Snyder, a leading creator of light shows, a merchandiser of a special 20th century kind of beauty. That is, beauty that is instantly perishable, infinitely changeable. I think uh, the discotheque scene at the end is, is unquestionably one of the best pieces of filmmaking on, on this level, I mean, especially in terms of a discotheque that, that I've ever seen, or at least I enjoy it, uh, every time I see it. I almost wait for that part to come on. I believe that, that light, when stimulated by uh, an intense color saturation, receives uh, an impression which in certain ways, psychologically, is similar to uh, an erotic and, and sexual uh, stimuli. I noticed this at discotheques, and I noticed this at uh, at light shows, uh, even uh, at some of the galleries. Um, there's something sensuous about light and the use of light in that medium. Uh, film, of course, is a natural, not be, uh, in terms of erotic light, not, not because it uses erotic images, or it has, but because the flickering patterns of light, uh, of necessity, uh, massage the retina of the eye. I try to make a jewel. I try to make the facets perfect and um, cut a, an emerald or, or ruby and uh, let it exist in, in light for a very short period of time. If it works, it's, it's beautiful. It's something which, uh, which I can't really talk about. It not, doesn't necessarily carry a message, a, a moral or, a, or some ethic. Something which glows, uh, which glows and, and attracts uh, almost hypnotically. It just is... Uh, um, it should have, for me, a, ju a jewel-like quality. See, in, in essence, uh, I'm kind of a, a modern-day alchemist. And I love to experiment with chemicals and processes and uh, all sorts of optical devices. Uh, so it's, it, it is a kind of a playful attitude. I think that many artists have this kind of attitude. They're curious about what's happening. You can't grab a beam of light and you can't uh, put it in your pocket or uh, sell it. Well, it's something to do with... Uh, trying to hold on to something, I think. Um, particularly in an age where uh, holding on to something uh, doesn't seem to have any meaning. There are two paradoxes in this. Lack of structure is in itself a kind of structure. Something is said about the quality of our lives, our world, after all. And film, good film, fixes an artist's vision, even one as transitory as a light show, forever. 
that is what attracts so many kids to it. That is why film schools like this one at the University of Southern California are suddenly so crowded, why new ones are starting all the time. They teach you to use the complex equipment of a complex art. More important, they offer an atmosphere of aesthetic excitement, of creative experiment. A graduate of USC, George Lucas, who made the prize-winning film THX 1138-43B. When I uh, first entered the University of Southern California, as I said, I didn't know anything about film. And uh, I didn't know what a filmmaker was. I didn't know what a producer was or a director or anything. All I knew was uh, I wanted to make film and uh, uh, whatever that entailed. Uh, having come out of uh, painting and art, uh, I'd had experience with uh, doing the... Uh, participating in, the, in, a, in a medium by oneself rather than a, than a bunch of people, and therefore I think I tended more toward the personal film than toward a group effort. At SC, filmmaking is taught. We start uh, with basic camera, basic editing, and move into working with crews made up of different individuals where the individuals and the crew have a great deal to say about how the film is made. It's a chance to work with young people who are all, all thinking you know, in radical new directions and uh, can bounce ideas off of each other. Film school is, to be very succinct, uh, a great environment to make films and a great environment to make films that, that have no purpose and uh, it gives you a real chance to experiment and to, uh, and to test your uh, abilities in the medium which is a chance you don't get once you get on the outside. And it's a good, a good chance for a person to get exposed to a lot of different types of film, a lot of different types of equipment. I made uh, as many types of films that I could possibly make. I wanted to make documentaries and experimental films and educational films and dramatic films. I wanted to you know, play around in all the, uh, the categories and uh, see which one I was best at, actually. Lucas is out of school now working with Francis Ford Coppola, himself a recent graduate of the film school at UCLA. Coppola is directing The Rain People, his third professional film for Warner Brothers. And Lucas is making a movie of him making a movie. I think this film, The Rain People, is, uh, is a good example of a, uh, of a personal film. Uh, where a man decides he's got an idea and he wants to carry it through, he writes it and directs it, and there is no one, no studio executive, uh, no producer, no one to tell him artistically what he has to do. And uh, I think this is a major breakthrough in uh, this type of filmmaking, especially in this country. It's, it's tending away from a factory and it's tending more toward an art center, if uh, I can use that term. And the director is becoming more important, and his ideas are becoming more important. On The Rain People, I'm making a film, a uh, cinema verite type diary, of uh, how a film is made, the daily struggle that goes on uh, with the director and with the crew, or with, the, uh, with the, the cameraman and the soundman and the, the editor, and uh, what their problems are every day and how they feel about things, and the personal problems that are faced every day on a set that nobody really realizes about. Right now I'm writing the, the script uh, THX 1138, which uh, I made a uh, short film in school, which was really only an experiment to test out some ideas I had. Uh, the short film uh, in no way really resembles the, uh, the uh, feature I'm going to do, except in uh, the technique and the, the look of it. THX 1138 was an experiment that worked. It won first prize at the National Student Film Competition. THX has no dialogue, plot, or characters in the usual sense. A succession of sounds and images, it recreates moods too familiar to modern man. Terror, alienation, paranoia, helplessness. The distortions and jumps on your set are part of the film's technique. Our machine, the camera, is used to indict the machine-made, machine-ruled universe. Of course we're not in love with them. We are... Uh, of course I don't love them. We were never in love with them. 
It's in the ideal way. You know that. We have like You know that. I know. I know. You know they're different. Arrow's bodies are just not as good. You know that. I know. I know.
I regret to inform you that your mate, THX 1138, destroyed themselves at 45239. All possible efforts were made by the authority to prevent this tragedy. I am truly sorry. You may obtain a new mate at Senate Man. Remember to file a male female preference card with the Pontifex and have your form K-300 filled out and ready for evaluation. The way out is on its way in. The film factories have hung help-wanted signs on their gates. Some say the film generation will receive a warm welcome inside. Others say they will be forced to run from the ubiquitous and omnipotent commercial machine. How will they fare? Stay tuned in for 20 or 30 years, and you may find out. Television Network.